want you to turn to Malachi chapter 4. If you don't know where that is, go to Matthew and take a left. These are the last, the last chapter out of the last book out of the Old Testament. And you know today, uh, what a great opening. Uh, we've gone through two weeks already of the supernatural life. We talked about supernatural vision, that God would open the eyes of the servant Elisha, that he would see the chariots of fire around him. Amen. Last week we talked about God's provision, that I've never seen the righteous forsaken, or God's seed beg for bread, and how we know that God, he knows how to provide for us in our moments of need. The, uh, Elijah came to the widow woman and said, you take and make a, a piece of bread for me first, which was really symbolic of putting God first. And he says that your flour will always be full and the canister of oil will always be full. And God provides. And today we're talking about the supernatural life with uh, an, uh, just a focus on healing. And God has really directed me to talk about today, to talk about uh, the hurt and abuse as well as physical healing. We know that God heals physically. How do we know that God healed in the Old Testament physically? He, in the life of Jesus, God healed people. And I believe that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus heals people that are sick. Amen? And so we'll certainly pray for you if you're sick today. But today I want to put a focus on this. And uh, as we go to pray over the message, I want to pray for Linda today. This isn't an easy time. Linda uh, loved her husband, Bob, very much. I read on Facebook yesterday, 50 years they were together. 50 years. That is a long time. And um, I know that, you know, there'll be moments that are difficult, but I want you to know we love you. We're praying for you, Linda and Lisa, and for your kids and the grandkids. And let's pray that the Lord surrounds them. Father God, we, we're so thankful, God, for all that you've done for us. And God, I pray, Lord, today that you'd be with Linda. God, I pray for Lisa. I pray, God, for this family and Jesus. You're the God of all comfort, Lord. You know how to help people in time of need. And God, I pray, Lord, that you're, you, you would surround them and help them, Lord, through these moments of difficulty. And God, I pray, Lord, as we go into your word, God, I pray for people that are here today that may be going through times of great difficulty and struggle. God, I pray today that you, Lord, would come with healing and your wings. And I pray, Lord, that you would minister to the broken and to the hurting today. God, we know that you know how to do this. We pray these things today in the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. Praise God. Uh, go with me, uh, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1. Now this is a, a passage about the end times. I want you to see that this is talking about in the end times what God would do. Understand, and I believe this, I believe that there is a former rain and a latter rain. The former rain was, I believe, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that happened at the day of Pentecost. The latter rain is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days. And I believe that here in the last days that God will pour his spirit out on all flesh and God wants to move. If you, if you go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, you don't have to turn there now, but most of you have read the scripture. It says that the, the Holy Spirit says expressly that in the last days that people will be treacherous, lovers of self. They'll be wicked and cruel, without affection. And folks, listen, just turn on the TV. Look at Paris. Look at not just Paris, but Beirut and Africa and Spain and America, the whole world. It's, it has become a 1 Timothy chapter 3 world. But in the midst of that 1 Timothy ch chapter 3, a world full of wickedness as the day of the Lord approaches, God always uh, wants to touch his church. I want you to know today that God's plan isn't to hide us away in the corner so that we can survive till the last day. God has called the church of Jesus Christ to stand in the last days with power and authority and life and strength. And so this passage is about what God will do in the last days. Here's what it says in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, the Lord of heaven's army says, the day of judgment is coming, is burning like a furnace, on that day, and notice this, the arrogant and the wicked will be, be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. I want to tell you, we live in a world of wickedness and arrogance. You say, well, what is arrogance? Arrogance is when political leaders, not just in America, but all over the world, have an agenda, but the agenda doesn't really include what God says. 
When we, go, when we go say, hey, we want to, if you want to lead a church or you want to lead a nation or you want to lead people and you go, well, here's what I, the way I want to do it, but God, I have no regard for what you say. I'm going to do it my way. That is the height of arrogance. The height of arrogance that says that God, you know, I know you created this and here we are, but I'm just going to do it my way. And that is the world that we live in. It's arrogant and it's wicked. And God in the midst of this is saying, listen, that whole system will be burned up. If you, people that go, well, I don't know, you know, pastor God, is, is, is he really going to bring judgment? Listen, God is a God of mercy and love. You turn your back on him and walk away, and you put yourself in a position of judgment. And it, it, the, again, it is, go, go to the Old Testament, you know, fire comes from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah. And to Lot's wife, who turns around, she's turned into a pillar of salt. I want you to know, God loves you. But to the one that turns away from God in wickedness and arrogance, it's not a very bright future. I love you, and because I love you, I want to tell you the truth. God's word says it. But it, the scripture doesn't stop there. He goes to verse 2. But for you who fear my name, is that you today? For you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, which is Jesus, will rise with healing in his wings, and you will go free, leaping like uh, leaping with joy like calves out, of, uh, out to the pasture. On that day when I act, you will tread upon the wicked as they were dust under your feet, says the Lord of heaven's army. What I want you to see is this. When the world gets wicked, when things go desperate, when uh, things like what has happened in Paris, and listen, the, as times go closer, I would like to tell you that it'll be insulated and the problem will be solved and it's just ISIS. If we can just defeat ISIS, we'll be done. But listen, there was Al-Qaeda Al and now there's ISIS and I don't know what's next, but it's probably, there's going to be another one behind them. Amen. But we don't live in fear. Because the son of righteousness will come with healing in his wings. And so today we know that God heals physically. But I want to talk about this, this, um, this, uh, uh, this abuse and how God wants to heal people who have been abused. Um, just going through this, there's three types of people that the Lord wants to do a work in your life today. And the first group I want to talk about uh, the abuse, physical abuse. Listen, as a pastor, one of the things that I do is I counsel with people I have for years. And how many times I've sat across the desk from somebody that starts to tell me that when they were a child, the abuse that they went through. I've heard stories, some of you that are here, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but you know, some of you have gone through some of this. And children, when they were young, would say, I knew when my dad came home, I could look into his eyes, I could see by his behavior I knew it wasn't going to be a good night if he'd been drinking. I, he, when the doorknob would open into my room and people have been, listen, there are people that are here. This isn't like just one or two people in our society. There's people that are in our society that have gone through terrible times of abuse. I want to tell you today, the son of righteousness will come with healing in his wings. Amen. Praise God. There's some of you that are here today and you've been, um, you've been assaulted sexually. I'm certainly not going to go into details. Um, statistics say nearly one in four women, I, I don't know if that's true, but this isn't one or two people, have been victims of some sort of sexual abuse. I want you to know today the Son of Righteousness is here with healing in his wings. There's some of you that are here today and you've been betrayed, you've been taken advantage of by family members, by friends. There's some of you that are here today that have been in marriages, and maybe you've been in marriages and you were the abuser. God still loves you. And maybe you're here today and you've been the one that was taken advantage of or lied to or cheated on. And listen, God loves you today. The son of righteousness is here and he has healing in his wings. I want you to know we live, this is the world that God said would happen in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and this is the world that we now live in. And we either have to ask ourselves, does God, can he address these issues or can he not? I want to tell you today in the name of Jesus, God has the power to address every issue and to help you and to heal you and to minister to you. Now, there's three responses that people have that have been through times of abuse like this. One is silence. And th that's why a, a woman many times that has been raped doesn't go to the police. And you go, well, why didn't she go to the police? Because sometimes the response is silence and isolation 
and withdrawing to themselves. And listen, if you're in that place today, I want you to know that God knows how to reach people that are in places of isolation and silence. Another thing, and sometimes it's sort of what grows to happen, is that some people go to a place of hopelessness and depression. They go through and they start to look at life and they, they start to behave this way, the way that they look at life and the things in life, they, they fall into a place of hopelessness. I want you to know Jesus knows how to reach in to hopelessness. The, the last way that people many times respond is with anger and bitterness. Sometimes people get angry at the person that hurt them. Today is Matthew talk. How many know that sometimes it's like when Jesus prayed for the man and he said, hey, I'll heal you today if you'll just believe. And what did the man say in return? He said, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. How many know that sometimes with forgiveness we say as Christians because we know that we need to forgive and we go, God, I forgive, but help thou my unforgiveness. So there's a process. It's a statement of faith, but a process that says, God, work in this process so that I can forgive people that have hurt me, that have betrayed me, that have done evil against me. God, I pray that you would bring that. So sometimes we're angry at the person. Sometimes we get angry at ourselves because I wish I would have done this or that, and why didn't I stand up for myself, and all the things that we can be angry at ourselves. And unfortunately, sometimes people become angry at God. I want to tell you, all three of those things are unhealthy, and all three of those things will cause damage. Today, Jesus, the son of righteousness, is here, and he has healing in his wings. Amen? Here's the second type of person, because some of you may be here today, and you go, man, Pastor John, I you know, never really had anything like that that I've experienced. But maybe the level isn't as, maybe as, as high as that. But all of us have experienced abuse or hurt to some level. Uh, now, when I say bullied at school, Everybody was made fun of in school. Can we just all say amen to that? Our noses were too big or too small, whatever the case. And we all have those issues. I had times, I was in a, raised in a poor neighborhood. I had a knife held to my throat at one point when I was about 11. Hey, it ain't always easy. But I thought I would bring a little bit of levity to the day because I know I've kind of figured at this point it would be a little serious. So I wanted to share a couple of things that happened to me when I was a kid where I was made fun of. It was really hurtful. I want you to know it was really painful. But my mother, because we were in a military family, we didn't have a lot of money, my mom would go and shop at Goodwill. Amen. Praise God for Goodwill. Nothing wrong with Goodwill. But she came home with the, with the, with the uh, sweater that had a hood on it that was as bright red as you can imagine. And the first day that I wore that to the bus stop and throughout the entire day, I became Little Red Riding Hood. <laughs> For the whole year, I was Little Red Riding Hood. I burnt, that has, there has to be ashes with that sweater somewhere. And that was bad, but it gets worse. It can get worse. I wore, my mom had Brought a, bought a sweater for me that she got at Goodwill, and so I wore it, you know, and I'm kind of walking around. And somebody says, hey, you got that sweater at Goodwill. And I said, you know, me being unsaved and lied through my teeth, I said, no, my mom got this at J.C. Penney's or whatever. And the kid says, nah, because I remember the stain. There was a stain on the shirt, a small stain. I remember when I put that stain on the shirt. You got that at Goodwill. I was like... It was the death of me. But uh, anybody have any of those kind of experiences? We all had something that we were bullied. But listen, there's some of us that had much more serious issues of being bullied or made fun of. And it still, you would be amazed at how many people to this day, years after it's happened, still are traumatized. Betrayal by friends or family or people that you trusted, lies and gossip. Listen, it's the world that we live in. Some of you have been at places where you have coworkers that have mistreated you or done things against you. You know, I was a meat cutter for nine years, so I've not always been a pastor. Um, and while I was going through Bible college, that's what I did. And I'm going to tell you, people can be mean at work, managers and owners. Amen? And listen, folks, there's a lot of hurt in this world, but people have gone through difficulty through some of those things. But the last thing that I want to talk about, the third group of people, is people who come in to church that have been hurt. 
Do you know as a pastor, I've really been surprised. I've always known this to be true. But coming back from Ireland, I was, you know, on the mission field for seven years. In the last three and a half years that I've done church here, I have heard so many people that have come to me, how they were hurt, how they were wounded at church. Uh, I was lied to. This happened. That happened. And people have stories of what's happened at church. And I want to say to you, whether it was intentional or not intentional, there are people that carry great difficulties because of church. Let me just say this. I, I know that most of the youth and young adults are over here, but let me just say this to every teenager and every young adult that's here today. Please be careful the way you treat each other. I know people who were in youth groups and in young adult groups, and they were treated so miserably that they won't walk back to church. And you go, well, I'm just being a teenager, just being my selfish little punky self. And uh, we've all been there. But be careful the way you treat. Be careful the way you love. It's important what you do because there's people that carry scars for the rest of their life because of the way. Now, I, I know we can say, well, toughen up a little bit. But at the same time, this is supposed to be a place of healing and restoration and when, second, when First Timothy chapter 3 starts to get into the church and we start to live like the world and behave like the world, man, it's not good. When we started the church three years ago, this was my prayer. I, anybody that was here, they know I've said this so many times over the life of our church. But I've said this, I, I am praying for an incredible, amazing miracle at the Springs Church. Do you know what my miracle that I'm praying for is this? That we have a church that people actually like each other. Because I have been in so many churches over my life that past, I've seen pastors not talk to each other, fight with each other, argue with each other behind the scenes, and then walk up to the stage with a big smile. Man, it's not authentic, it's not real, and I want nothing to do with that. I'm saying in the house of God, God, let us love people with your love and have a heart for everybody that walks through the doors. And if somebody comes in and they look different or they act different, that's okay, we still love them. Man, if you come in and you've got, I don't have any piercings. I know, praise God, somebody say amen for that. I don't have any tattoos, but listen, if you have tattoos or piercing, we love you and you are welcome in this house. And nobody look at somebody that has a piercing or a tattoo and don't look down at them. Amen, we love them. Patricia, I see somebody laughing over there. So uh, that's just the way it should be. Everybody that walks through those doors. Now listen, there'll be times that we have to say to people, you can't come in if you're drunk. You can't come in if you're doing drugs. You know, there's some, we have to have some standards. But everybody that walks through those doors, we will love them and we will help them. And that's our heart. It's the heart of God. I want to read a story. If you'll go to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 4 of something that had happened. Now this was unintentional. And I want you to see that sometimes the hurt can be unintentional, but it's still hurt and it's still traumatic. And I want you to draw a picture from here. You know, I, I love the word. I love the scriptures. And as we go through this, you may look at it and go, well, it's just a nurse that dropped a child. But I want you to see a picture here, if you would. I want you to see this nurse as the picture of the church. And if you would, you can put Pastor John in that place or the body of Christ and how we are called to handle because she's caring for the son of a king, the grandson of a king, Mephibosheth. And she's there to care for this child. We have a responsibility in the way that we treat people, the way we handle people, the way that we care for people. And I want you to see this story in the light of this woman, uh, this nurse, as a picture of the, of, of the body of Christ. Look at this with me if you would. Saul's son Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel uh, that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. When the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up and she fled. But as she hurried away, she dropped him and he became crippled. Now, I want you to see the story for just a moment. I, I don't believe that the woman was intentionally out to hurt this child. But understand this. She didn't know the heart of David. You see, King Saul uh, was very mean to David. People thought that David was out for Saul and Jonathan, but he wasn't as all, at all. And if you read through the story, you'll see that David had a kind heart. But the nurse thought that King David would come to kill this, this child who could be an heir. Uh, and so what she does is she takes a five-year-old and she picks him up and she starts to run with him. Now, let me just ask you a question. How many know that five-year-olds can run? 
How many grandparents have watched a kid that's five years old and you're like, stop, <laughs> I gotta breathe, <laughs> okay? Five-year-olds can run, three-year-olds can run, four-year-olds can run. He's five years old, there was no need to pick him up. But look, she was in fear. And when people start to operate in fear, they start to do things that aren't necessarily the wisest. And I want you to see this, when the church starts to operate in fear, people get dropped and people get hurt. And the church, listen, as the church of Jesus, we are not called to operate in fear. We're called to operate in faith and to love people and to help people. And certainly, even inadvertently, we're not called to drop. And listen, it wasn't just a simple drop. It wasn't just, oh, oops, you know, you just bumped your head. He, the drop was so hard and it was so difficult that this young boy would be crippled for life. As this woman, this nurse, is supposed to be there to care and to love for this child. And so listen, here's my, my message to you is this. Is that as a church, people will come in to this place looking for answers. They'll come in, they're broken and they're hurting and they abuse. The first Timothy chapter 3 people will walk through and they've been hurt and burned by this world. Amen. And when they come here, sometimes you go, well, I didn't do anything to them. But how did we care for them? How did we love them? And in my prayer today is this, God help us not to drop the people that come in for help, that we would show them the love and the kindness of Jesus, because the son of righteousness will come with healing in his wings. And listen, if you love Jesus and you want to be like Jesus, guess what you'll start to do? You'll start to be that agent, that facilitator of the love and the kindness and the mercy of God. Are you with me? Now, go, go with me uh, to 2 Samuel chapter 9. And as we go through this story, I want you to see that this boy was traumatized. He's five years old. So before this, you know, he kicked the soccer ball. He, if they had soccer, Owen says they had soccer back then, the, our European friend. Uh, I don't know that, but he ran, he played, he, but on this day, I don't think he ever forgot this day. It was traumatic. I don't think it was intentional by the nurse, but how many know that people go through traumatic experiences and it left him for the rest of his life paralyzed in his legs. And on top of that, not, not only that, but then they whisk away. She, he's in, he now will begin to live in fear his whole life. The King David is after me to kill me. So I want you to get a picture of where this boy is at, the, tr the, the, trauma, the traumatized young boy and what he's going through. And so, listen, as, as these people that are hurting and broken come in, it's important that we exemplify the love of God. Folks, listen, tonight we've got couples ministry, singles ministry. We don't just do these to keep people busy. If you think, you know, Pastor John sits in his office and goes, I just wonder what else can we do to keep people at church 24-7? I don't do that. And as a matter of fact, what we try to do is do these things on Sunday night. So we've got Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Everybody can't make it to everything, but as much as you can. But the reason that we do these ministries is because we want couples to get help. We want people to come to a place and get connected. That's the, that is equal. Listen, when we come into church, we want the presence of God here because the presence of God can do anything. We want the word of God because the word of God instructs us and helps us. But we can have the presence of God and we can have the word of God. But if we don't have the heart of God in what we do, we are drastically missing something. If all you are is the you know, uh, I'll apologize before I say it, but all of you are is an egghead Christian and you can study the verses and you can turn to the scriptures and tell me what they say, but you don't have the heart of God. I think God says in 1 Corinthians 13, you become a clanging gong and clanging cymbal, something like that. But God doesn't care how much you know until what you know gets into your heart and comes alive. Amen? So today... I want you to understand every ministry, men's, women's, couples, singles, youth, young adults, especially youth, how important this is for teenagers. And if you're here, Pastor Owen and the staff that's there, that we really attempt to do this. We want this to be a wholesome environment because the youth culture that we live in is going so hard and so fast away from God. And we want to see a ministry that touches kids and help to disciple kids so that they can grow in a healthy environment. Amen. Keep them in your prayers. Amen. And we love what God is doing with our teenagers. But maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you've been through a time of difficulty. And you're going, God, do you even care? I want to go to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 
and I want you to see this picture of Jesus. Now, David is the most perfect picture of Jesus in the Bible. That's why he's called uh, Jesus the son of David, or the Messiah is the son of David, because he's the most uh, perfect picture of Christ. And in this story, uh, David had been king for a few years, and this is the heart of David, but it's a picture of the heart of Christ for people that are hurting. Look with me in 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 1. It says this, one day David asked, is anyone in Saul's family that's still alive? Now understand this, Saul attempted to kill, he ran after David to kill David for years. Now when you come to a place of healing is when you can say, God, let me find that family and show kindness. Matthew, what a great testimony. Thank God for what he's doing in his life. But the fact that the first thing that he wants to do is to forgive the man that per perpetrated the evil upon him. I want to tell you, when you are able to forgive those who have done things against you, it will be a great day of freedom in your life. I'm just saying. Uh, so David comes to this place and he says, is there anybody that I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And he summoned a man named Ziba who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba? The king asked. And yes, sir, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? Uh, if so, I want to show God's kindness to them. And Ziba replies, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he, the king asked. In Lobadar, Ziba told him, at the home of Makar and the son of Emil. Now, here's what I want you to see. The name Mephibosheth if you go to the meaning of the name, it means the one of shame, the person who lives in shame. Now listen, he didn't do anything wrong. He was dropped. Why should he live in shame? But that's where he was at. Some people, it doesn't make sense, but that's what abuse and hurt and difficulty does because they find themselves in a place that doesn't make any sense. Why are you ashamed? He, didn't, he hadn't done anything, but that was the life that he lived. And they had taken him to the place of Lobadar. Lobadar, if you look it up, is the place in the wilderness. So he was living a life of shame. He had run to the wilderness to hide from the king. And now he is, he, he's waiting in the back room, a crippled boy that has no power against the army of the king. And he's waiting every day for the knock on the door. But he thinks when the knock on the door comes, it's to come and to destroy him. He doesn't realize that the knock on the door is the kindness of God coming to help him. And listen, there are people that are here today. And you think that somehow God is against you. I want to tell you, whatever brokenness or hurt or difficulty that you've been through, God is not against you. God is for you. It is David who is seeking Mephibosheth out to show him kindness. God is seeking you out, out of his kindness to show you love and grace. He has nothing against you. He looks at the man who is in isolation in the place of the wilderness that's full of shame, and he wants to bring them and show kindness. And so the servants come. They knock on the door. They bring them along. So in verse 5 it says, So David sent for him and brought him from Makir's home, and his name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. And when he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. And David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth replies, I am your servant. Now David sees, he looks at this boy and he sees, man, this kid is afraid. He, he, he's starting to understand, Do you think I'm here to harm you? I'm not here to harm you. So he says to him, don't be afraid, David says. I intend to show you kindness because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. Now, anybody that knows the story, we could go back and look at it, but, but there was a, an agreement that Jonathan and David had entered into. A, they loved each other. There was a kindness. Some people have taken and marred that uh, for the wrong reasons, but there was a true love and a kindness that they had for one another. And the agreement was this, is that I will love your people and you will love my people. And he says, listen, based upon the agreement that I had with Jonathan, I want to show you kindness. Now, look at this. I believe that Father God and Jesus in heaven, before Jesus ever came to the earth, there was an agreement between the Father and the Son. I don't know if they had a cup of coffee and talked about it, but I know that there was an agreement because the Father and the Son always worked together uh, uh, in unison. And so the agreement was this, Son, you're going to have to go to this earth and be born and die and give your life. It's going to be a cruel, terrible world full of all of the filth and the degradation, and you're going to have to be born into this life. At the end of it, they're going to treat you terribly. They're going to crucify you, and you will become the sin offering for all of mankind. 
But if you do this, when you do this, everyone that puts their faith and trust in you, I will declare that person righteous and we will bring them into a place of healing. You will be the son of righteousness and you will come with healing in your wings for every bit of brokenness and despair and abuse, no matter what the trouble is, God loves you and he wants to show kindness based upon the agreement of what Jesus did at the cross. If you ever get that in your heart, it will just change the way you think about God. He is not against you, he is for you, amen. So he says, based upon that agreement, can we give God glory for that? Thank you, Jesus. Now, now look at this. He says, uh, he, he says, don't be afraid. I want to show you kindness. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. But look at Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and, ex and exclaimed, who is your servant that you should show such kindness to me like a, uh, to a dead dog like me. Now, do you start to get into the understanding of this boy? What a traumatic experience. But the way he sees himself is, why would you show kindness to me? I'm a dead dog. I have nothing to give you. I have nothing to offer you. But this is people that have been hurt. And there's people that are here today that have been through times of abuse or hurt, and you feel unworthy. You feel worthless. You feel like, you know, God, you know, hopeless. I want to tell you that is wrong thinking and that traumatic experience of, abu of abuse has left you at that place. God wants to bring a fresh understanding of what he thinks about you and how he loves you. He wants to bring this into your heart. And so he's looking at this, at this young man and he's saying, listen, with all of this, I'm, you're not a dead, you will come and sit at my table and you will live in my palace. How many you know that is the love of God? We come to him with brokenness, we come to him with emptiness, and he says, no, listen, I love you. You're going to sit at my table, and you're going to eat at the king's table, and you're going to live in my palace, and every day you walk down and you see the, the armor of your father, Jonathan, you will know that because of an agreement that Jonathan made and what he did, I declare you righteous and you live in my home. That's good news. And church, that's what Jesus did for us. And so he says, so the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba. I've given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your son and your servants are to farm the land and to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. And I want you to see that this is the love and the heart of God. Listen, when you are abused, when you are mistreated, when this world is unkind to you, when people are unkind to you, even when you come to church and the church drops you, Jesus loves you and he wants to show you kindness. The heart of God here is to say, wake up to righteousness. Wake up to what I want to do in your life. Stop living in this place of Lobadar. Stop living in this place of isolation because I want to do a miracle in your life today I want to see the supernatural life of God bring healing into this house. There are some of you that are here today, and you need the Lord to heal you and to deliver you and to help you. Go to Ezekiel chapter 34. How many of you love Jesus today? Amen. When you look at this story, and if you see that that story of David is a picture of Christ and what he's done for us, you can't help but shout and thank God for all that he's done. He is so merciful to us. In Ezekiel 34, I won't read all of it, but in verses 1 through 10, it talks about evil shepherds. It talks about people who are selfish and they do ministry or they're shepherds that feed themselves and I want to live in the, uh, the big palace and have the money and take care of me and my family, but the sheep themselves sort of go to waste. And God says he looks down at this and he becomes very angry. And I wanted to say to you, church, there's too much of the church world that's like this. Too much of the church world that's about the pastors and the leaders. And it's not enough about loving the sheep. And I want to tell you today, in, our, in this church family, what would ever happen, not just if I would find my place as a pastor that loves and cares for people, but between this service and the earlier service, we have five, six hundred adults that are here. And listen, what would ever happen if five or 600 people got the heart of Jesus to pastor and to love people and to care for people, it's the very heart of God. In the end days, that's the latter reign, is that when the people of God ever get his heart and says, Lord, help me to reach out to people. Now understand this. If you're at a church of 30 people 
or 300 people or 3,000 people. No one person, myself included, I don't have the capacity to meet every need, even if it's 30 people. Amen? How many know that just because the church is small doesn't mean that it's healthy and loving and giving? <laughs> you can be at a small church where people gossip and clamor and everything else. I, but what I'm saying to you is I can't meet every need, and you can't meet every need, but you can meet somebody's need. You can reach out to somebody. Maybe you say, well, I, I, I can't get to know everybody, but you can get to know somebody. You can show the love of God to somebody. And when we come into these groups and ministries and even just out having coffee, take the time to love somebody and to help somebody and to show the love of God. That is the heart of God. So God says, that, you know, he looked at these shepherds and the way that the church ran and operated and they were so selfish and so about them and me and my five friends and no more. And he comes and he says, for this, look at verse 11, for this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search and find my sheep. I will be like a shepherd looking for the scattered flock. I will find my sheep and rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on that dark and cloudy day. I want you to know we have a good shepherd, which is Jesus. And he goes to rescue and to find the hurting and the broken. Folks, listen. I am not really your pastor. I mean, I am. God placed me here to be his hands and feet extended, but the Bible says that he's the good shepherd. He is your shepherd. I'm an under shepherd. I want to be the extension of his love uh, poured out to you, but he, it's his love and his kindness. So if we reach out to somebody that's hurting or broken or scattered, that's, that's Jesus that's reaching out to them. And my prayer is this, is will we be like the world? And folks, listen, I'm, I'm just going to say to you, because it's the way that so much of the church runs. You, you get into places and people gossip about each other, and they talk about each other, and they spend their time, and, you know, I'm on your side, and you're on my side, and I like this lady leader, you like that lady leader, I like this man, you, uh, man leader, you like that I, I like Pastor Matt, no, I like Pastor Owen. Listen, can we stop all of that? And can we say we love Jesus, and we love everybody that's here? Wouldn't that be an amazing church to attend? Amen. We can have that kind of a church. Youth group. You can have that kind of a youth group. It doesn't have to be my group and your group. Now listen, we're always going to find our people group and our friends and things. We're always going to find that. But listen, can we just say we just love everybody and reach out to everybody and show kindness to everybody? And folks, now listen, there is a part you have to play because I'm not going to go come to your house and go, I know. You don't want to get involved with a couple's ministry. So I'm here to reach out to you. Hey, listen, you're going to have to take a little step yourself. You're going to have to say, hey, let me avail myself. I need help. We've got living free. We've got couples. We're starting the first of the year. We're starting with 25 couples to go through with James Dobson to be trained to be marriage mentors. Because we believe that marriages are so important and there's such an attack on marriages. And we want people that are struggling in marriages to be able to come in, whether it's in the church or out of the church, and find somebody that can help and reach out and show the love of God. But what are we doing? Folks, this isn't just a time to come and kind of do our little thing and go our own way. This is a place where the church of Jesus Christ comes to show his life and his love and his power. That's the way we want to be. That exemplifies Jesus is happy when we live that way. When we live the other way, he's not so happy. Read all of Ezekiel 34 and you'll find this to be true. Go with me down to verse 15. He says, I myself will tend to my sheep. I will give them a place to lie down in peace, says the Lord, the sovereign Lord. I will search for my lost ones who strayed away and I will bring them safely home again. And I will bandage the injured and strengthen the weak. Listen, this, this is the heart of Jesus for his people. You're, you're here today. Some of you are just visiting. Some of you have been here, and this is your church family. Whoever you are, I want to tell you today, God loves you. He loves you. He wants to bandage your wounds. As a church family that's here, we want to love people and care for people. When they come with their hurt and their brokenness, the son of righteousness will come with healing in his wings because he wants to help people. He loves people. This is the heart of God. Amen? If, if you would, go with me. This will be the last passage, and we'll go right to the altar. Go to Titus chapter 3. Before I read this, 
Don't shift the blame like your first parents did. You know who your first parents were? Adam and Eve. And how did they shift the blame? God comes to Adam and says, Adam, why'd you eat the apple? Eve. Okay, uh, Eve, why'd you eat the apple? The serpent. And you know what? People, and we still do it, we're still sometimes like our first fathers. And we don't want to accept responsibility. We want to go, well, that person hurt me, and this happened to me, and you don't know what I've been through. But listen, the way you respond to it is important to God. And if you just went off with hurt, and you just got mad at God or mad at people or mad at yourself, and it, there needs to be an acknowledgement where you come and you say, God, I haven't really handled this fully the way that I was supposed to, but today, God, I want you to come, and I want you to heal me, and I'm not making excuses. I want to come for a place of healing. Maybe what you did is cause yourself trouble. Maybe it was an accident. Perhaps you're here today, and somebody inflicted a great wrong against you. Whatever the case, if you're in the place of isolation and shame and brokenness, in that place of Lobadar, God wants to come and he wants to heal you and he wants to help you and he wants you to walk through this difficulty, amen? And so it says now in Titus chapter 3 and verse 3, once we too were foolish and disobedient, we were misled and, and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures, our lives were full of evil. Um, and envy, and we hated each other, or we did not have a pure love for each other. I, w I want you to see this. That's all of us. It doesn't say some of us were like this. If you go, no, that's not me. I've just always been good. I've never done anything wrong. Whatever. <laughs> I don't believe you, okay? And nobody else really does either. You can keep saying it, but they don't believe it, especially if you're married, because your spouse knows, okay? <laughs> but when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, what a picture of David, King David, when he revealed his kindness and love. He saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth. If you don't believe in being born again, you need to go back and read this a few times. And the new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life and everything that goes with it. Amen. But go down with me to verse 10. He goes through and he talks about some different things. He says, this is what the Lord has done. But if people are causing divisions among you, Give them a first and a second warning. After that, have nothing more to do with them. For people like that have turned away from the truth and their sins condemn them. Now, understand this. It doesn't, it doesn't say God condemns them, but their sins does. Now, listen, I didn't read that last part because I'm going to start naming people and asking you to leave the church. Not at all. As a matter of fact, this is what I have found. Over the three years, and we're just a short time period that we've been a church, but we've seen people come. And you know what? I can see because, listen, I bounced bars before I was a Christian. And now as a pastor for 25 years, how do you know I've seen just about everything come and go? And God has given me a discernment with people. And so people come. I see the hurts many times. Many times I see people come in that are broken. Many times I see people that come in that are loud and obnoxious. Amen? And other people that come in that are quiet and solemn. Sometimes all of them have the issues that need to be dealt with. But this is what I found. When they come into an environment, sometimes we have people that do all sorts of things. But when they come into a loving environment, what I have noticed over the years, and anybody that's been here, you'll see this. After a while of being in a healthy, loving place, they stop all that. They stop the gossiping. They stop the divisions. They stop, they stop acting like they've acted in other places. And we're certainly not perfect here. Uh, we have people that come from everywhere. But this is the heart of God. And I'm saying to you, if, if Paul dealt with this in Titus back in the first century, we deal with these things. But we have to be on guard. And then he gives a remedy that says, hey, don't tolerate that in the house of God because we don't have to be like that. We are not like the world. We're not to behave like them. We don't gossip like them. We don't cause divisions like they cause. We are here to love and to help people and to share with people. That is the heart of God. So today, listen, today is a two-pronged message. One is if you're here and you're broken, God wants to heal you. But it secondly is this. It's a message to the church, folks. 
This has to be a place where Jesus resides so that his people come in. They can be healed of their hurts and their difficulties because people are hurting. Do you know, if you don't know this, it's because you have about 10 Christian friends that you hang out with all the time. Because if you get outside of a little circle of comfort and you start to get out with real people, I'm going to tell you there are people that are going through junk. There are hurts and pains and difficulties. And if the church of Jesus isn't the answer, where's the answer? If this isn't a place to come and they won't be dropped, where will they go? Because I will tell you, the world will definitely drop them. I pray to God that in this house, we hold them and we love them, and we don't walk in fear, we walk in faith, and we see the kindness and the love of God poured out. King David said, bring me one from Saul's house who came after me to kill me, that I would show kindness. And today, God wants to show you kindness, no matter how broken you are, no matter how paralyzed you are, no matter how empty you are, no matter what you've been through, who has abused you, who has hurt you, whatever you've been through today, the son of righteousness is in this place and he has healing in his wings. The question is, will you trust him? I want every head bowed, every eye closed, worship team. Praise God. Praise God. I want you there for a moment to take a moment and consider this. Some of you have spent your life trying to hide your shame, your pain, your anguish, your difficulty. Some have been abused by mothers and fathers. Some have had husbands and wives. Some have had family members. Some have had friends. Some of you, it's been people at work. Some of you, it's been people at school. But you're here today and you're carrying all of these things. I, th I thank God. Owen said it earlier. God never meant for you to carry the burden. He meant for you to lay the burden down because he wants to carry it for you. But don't stay in a place of isolation. Don't live in the place of the wilderness. Don't be in a place where you're paralyzed. God wants to bring and do an abundant work above anything you can ask or imagine or think. The enemy came to steal and kill and destroy. But God has come that you may have life. Jesus has come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Today, he has that for you. But you can't sit in that place any longer. God wants to bring healing and restoration to you. No more excuses anymore today. Today is the day of healing. The son of righteousness has come, Malachi chapter four, with healing in his wings. And he wants to share his healing virtue and power. Don't just hide it, be free of it. God wants to restore and bring healing. No matter how great the offense or no matter how small the offense, don't live with that offense another moment of another day, God wants to bring healing. Wherever you're at, you come and begin to make your way. Father God, I pray today, God, that this would be a place of healing and restoration. Jesus, I pray today, people that have carried things, Lord, even for years, God, today, that they would find freedom. God, I pray, Lord, for people that are physically sick. We thank you that you heal yesterday, today, and forever. Today, you are still our healer. And if there's anybody that's here with physical sickness, God, I pray that you would heal them today. In Jesus' name, worship. You breathe, God, on every man, every woman. God, I pray, Lord, for those that, Lord, are full of shame. And, Lord, it's even hard just even to walk to an altar. God, I pray, Lord, for people that have been in abusive and difficult situations. Jesus, we look to you today. God, help us. And, Lord, we pray, God, for a lost world, God, that's around us every day. Lord, people at work, people at school, people that are around us, God, that are needy and broken and hurting. God, I pray today that, Lord, that the love of God, Lord, would fill our hearts. God, I pray that that one, that son of righteousness with healing in his wings, God, I pray, Lord, that you would live in us and through us, God. I pray, Lord, that we would be facilitators of your grace, God, that we would go to people that are broken and bring them to the foot of the cross, Lord, that you can do a mighty work of healing in every heart and every life. Jesus, we love you. God, I bow your heads for a moment, if you would. Because, listen, the greatest thing that you can get today isn't physical healing. It's not even emotional healing. The greatest thing that can happen to you today is for you to give your life to Jesus. But you're here today and you would say, I just need Jesus to be my savior. 
listen, if you're here, the greatest thing that can happen, because when Jesus gets inside of your heart and the life and the presence of God, he brings healing and restoration and help along the way. He wants, to, listen, before he does the miracle in your life, he wants to save you, which is the greatest miracle. So if you're here today, every head bow, every eye closed, and you would say, today, pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to give my life to you. And today I want to pray that prayer. Jesus, Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner, and today I need you. I ask for your grace and kindness. I don't deserve it, but I ask you, Lord, in faith. I thank you for dying on the cross, and I ask you, Lord, to forgive me and to restore me and to help me. I'm like Mephibosheth. I'm paralyzed, but I've come to the king's table, and God, I pray for your freedom and your life, and your healing. And God, I pray today that you would save us completely. We pray these things in your mighty name. Amen. Praise God. Let's give God thanks one more time.